And welcome. Uh, this is Tom Heck. I'm Tom Heck, and uh, welcome to a another broadcast of the International Association of Teamwork Facilitators. And we have a special guest on with us today. His name is Joe Frontera, and he is the co-author of Team Turnarounds, a playbook for transforming underperforming teams. And uh, he also co-authors a column in the Washington Post, uh, published in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, he's got a Ph.D. in sports psychology, which we're going to ask him some questions about today. And he specializes in understanding and harnessing the power of organizational culture. He is the co-founder of Mino Consulting, uh, which is M-E-N-O uh, Consulting.com. I'm going to put up a slide with that uh, here in a minute. Uh, and he is a world traveler who has happened to land recently in California uh, for a new job, a new position, and we're going to learn a little bit about that because it's actually working for a company that uh, my kids use uh, their products. So um, anyway, uh, Joe, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. Thanks very much, Tom. I appreciate uh, the introduction. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, well, so I'm wondering, Joe, if we could start here. Uh, your PhD is in sport psychology from the University of West Virginia, and I'm wondering if, if you could, one, if we could start off by understanding what, is, what do sports psychologists do, what is, and who tends to gravitate to sports psychology? Maybe if you could tell us about what uh, caused you to be interested in it, and then I'd like to explore sort of the jump from sport to uh, leadership and, and how you made that jump from sport to just leadership in general, whether it's with sports or in the office. Sure, yeah, and I think, I think that's a great question to start off. And uh, traditionally, sports psychology has been used with individual athletes, and, and essentially it's, it's how do they develop the mental skills and the mental toughness to perform you know, at their best. Um, and when I got in the program, I, I would, I'd already had a previous career in sales, and I had some, you know, pretty fascinating experiences in, in that world, where, you know, I was a part of one, so, yeah, I was a part of one team that essentially was, you know, work hard, play hard, it was a lot of fun to be there, um, and then we got bought by a company called WorldCom, and WorldCom, you know, everyone knows, that was one of the largest <laughs> Scandals at the time, and but when they yeah. took over that that company that I was first at, um, everything changed, and and the entire atmosphere around the office just got worse. So when I got to my grad step, my you know grad school, and, and I started looking at sports psychology, I was informed both both by my athletic career and my business career, and I think that um, I started looking at sports psychology a little bit differently. So where most people are looking at working with individual athletes and trying to help that individual person perform better, hmm. I was looking more at what kind of culture was the, the coach creating with their team. You know, how, how did what they do impact uh, that team to help the team become more, more effective? Because at the end of the day, that's, that's what it's all about is, is wins and losses and performing at your best. Um, so so I, I think uh, I went to a lot of the organizational dynamics, the, o, the OD literature, uh, you know, throughout my studies, and that's what it, what really fascinated me um, was how how do how do leaders um, impact teams in the in the best possible way, and, and conversely, what do they do that that uh, might make things a little bit more difficult on their team that they're not even aware of? Well, it's it's interesting because uh, I I've had conversations in the not too distant past with several. Um, well, there was one division one women's soccer coach and a division two uh, NCAA for those not familiar maybe you can describe what division one two and three are but right. a division two women's uh, lacrosse coach mm -hmm. and both of these coaches contacted me because of uh, of the very issue that you're talking about is um, what they're it's interesting they're both complaining about essentially the same thing is that uh, I have uh, the way I've been doing leadership development in the past is not working. Mm -hmm. In other words, um, they both sort of uh, hoped that a leader would or leadership would somehow evolve on the team, 
And now they're finding themselves in the place, and I don't know why, if this is a cultural thing, just in general, or is it something with women's sports, but um, leaders are not evolving. And so when I ask them if either of them have a, uh, a, um, a methodology to take their uh, players from being new to leadership to being a leader, neither one had a plan for that. Yeah. Uh, so, so can you just briefly talk about that, about what does it take to uh, um, create leaders on a sports team? Not that we're going to be talking about sports the whole time. Right. We're going to be making the jump to business, but it's this idea that um, the assumption is that somehow leadership is just going to happen if we just get out there on the field enough. Yeah, I think I think that's a widespread as assumption in college athletics or, or any athletics. Is it you know you make the assumption that so you bring the freshmen in and over time they're going to develop into leaders you know in, in an ad hoc manner and by the time they're seniors they're going to be the leaders that you're going to rely on. Yes, and that's definitely you know that's sometimes it works out really well and and sometimes you have people that kind of gain those experiences that help them become leaders. But the vast majority of the time. Um, you know, when a, when a coach comes to me and says, we don't have any leaders on the team, and, and I say, well, I ask them the same question that you asked. Well, what are you doing to develop leaders? Mm. And they say, well, well, not, what do you mean? <laughs> and, and so, but there has to be that intentionality on their part to put them through some sort of curriculum, and it helps them explain what it means to be a leader, you know, at least from that coach's perspective. Right. And I think from my perspective, when, when that question is lob, lobbed at me, um, I think the, the first thing that I do is I ask the coach, well, what, what do you mean by a leader? What, what does a leader do in your mind? And really try to solidify what that vision of a leader means, and then we can develop a curriculum based on that. But it has to, and, and that's a, an insight that, you know, you know, speaking of the book, Mike Daly, he's the, the head coach at Tufts University. Um, he had that insight on his own. He, he realized that, like, we're, we're pointing out there on the field and saying there's no leadership out there. But we should be pointing at ourselves because we haven't done anything to create those leaders over the last four years. And that's something that we need to change. And so what he did is he started to, um, you know, put, you know he, he, made, he makes his team read the five dysfunctions of team or other leadership books. And he has a, a group of people that kind of, for four years, they, they meet with him on a regular basis talking about various leadership concepts. And that's something that's worked really well for him. But that's, that's one solution. There's, there's definitely a, a lot um, when it comes to developing leaders on any team. Yeah, it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, realizing that people need to swim. Like you and I are both parents and we both want our kids to learn, know how to swim, right? And, and so we, we all recognize swimming is important. It could even be life-saving. And that uh, once we are, we all are all on that page that we say, oh, well, then the way to teach that is to just push somebody into the pool. <laughs> Right, um, but we. How common is that in in, in leadership development? So, um, so you you share with us a little bit about sports psychology. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about uh, you. You've also taught leadership at West Virginia University. Can you tell us what it's? Uh, you know, most people before we got on the the broadcast here, you and I were talking about that. Most people will pick up books like yours mm -hmm. and and study leadership outside of a university, outside of a classroom session, right. maybe they're listening to audio recordings or whatnot. Who is it that takes a leadership class? Who were you teaching and where were they going? What were they doing with what you were teaching them? Yeah, I think I think it varies. So there's not there's definitely not one, you know, subset of kids that were taking these classes. What I noticed is that, you know, some of them were taking it for a major major or minor requirement. Some were taking taking it because they felt like it was something that they were missing. That you know they might be business majors and they they hope to be a leader in the industry someday, and so they wanted to get some sort of foundation to to build upon. Um, other people just just take it because they're interesting or they thought the class looked interesting. One of the one of the courses we taught was called leadership in sport, um, and it was in the College of Arts and Sciences, and and a lot of people that were sport fans thought it thought it looked like a great class, so they took it and. You know, my, my belief when it comes to teaching is I, I think, you know, even at the college age, um, these, these students have a lot of experiences that they can pull on. So I think that I'm a big advocate of the idea that, that we're all leaders um, in, in various capacities, and we've all had experiences where we've been able to practice those leadership skills, but sometimes we need to tease those out a little bit to really 
try to garner uh, more insight about you know what we did well, what we didn't do well, and, and just try to raise general awareness about where we're at as leaders and where we need to grow. So did you have any surprises in teaching leadership at, at that level, as in um, that as you worked with young younger people who were sort of on their path to, like you said, becoming a leader in industry someday or in a business or maybe that they start or that they join, did you have any surprises uh, becoming in the instructor role like, wow, mm -hmm. I uh, would have thought people would have known this, um, that this is common knowledge or that, wow, they're further along than I was ever at when they were at, I was at that age. Yeah, I think, so one one big thing that jumped out um, is that, and, and I don't know if this is specific to the millennial generation or if it's something that, that spans all generations, but I don't think, especially at, at the millennial age, where they, they're they always on, right? They all, they're available through Twitter, they have email, they have Facebook, they, whatever social, you know, new social media is out there. They're always available. They have their cell phone. And I think um, what became pretty apparent to me is a lot of those folks don't take a lot of time to reflect and they don't take a lot of time to just think about you know what what they're going about doing on a daily basis. They're just reacting to the things that are coming in at them and in, in, at them. And I think uh, one of the biggest things that I tried to get across is that just the whole concept of, of reflection and self-awareness and why it's important. And, and how to go about doing it. So, so that was that was something that really jumped out over the past four years. Hmm. Um, and it's it's something that I've always found value, valuable. And maybe maybe it's a product of my Jesuit education. I'm not sure. So, <laughs> well, uh, real quickly, what is what is the sport that you competed in at the collegiate level? Yeah, I, I a road crew at um, Santa Clara University, mm -hmm. and so it's a, a small small school just. Uh, South of San Francisco, and uh, we we I did that for three years and had an awesome experience doing it. But e even within that, you know, even within that three-year time period, um, you know, I, I saw some coaches were awesome and they they really were able to get the best out of us. And other coaches, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, I think they what they some of what they did led to disengagement from from the athletes and from us. And so. Uh, that was another thing that informed my decision to go back to school for sports psychology. Huh. All right. So uh, I'd like to jump to uh, our the book. Uh, and so, by the way, if you are watching this live uh, over on the uh, uh, on the Google Events page, where this is streaming live right now, there is a chat feature where you can uh, write a question in to me. I'm paying attention to that, so Joe doesn't have to, and I will relay your question to Joe and uh, so that we can make this somewhat interactive um, and so that you can get some information about what does it mean to turn around a team that you're working with. So I've got a, a, a something from the book here that you, you write about. You wrote that uh, in, in your research with owners and general managers in professional sport uh, and leaders of businesses of all sizes, one thing became apparent. Leaders that change the fortunes of their teams first transform the culture. What do you mean, when you say culture, what exactly is included in that umbrella of cult changing and transforming culture? Yeah, and I think that's a great question because I think you hear that a lot. We need to change the culture of this organization. We need to change the culture of this team. And I think a lot of people, uh, it, it's just an ambiguous catchphrase, right? It, it's catch-all. Um, but when, when I say culture, I, I think there's three different levels. And, and I'm, I'm going based on uh, this guy at MIT. His name's Edgar Schein. And he, he's one of the, you know, the, the fathers of, of OD. And he, he believes that culture has three levels. The first level is, is what you see. So if you look behind me, you see a jersey of Carmelo Anthony. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm working at Electronic Arts. So that's something that represents you know, who Electronic Arts is and what they value. So that's that's that surface level. It's what you wear to work. You know, it, it's a very casual environment here. So everyone wears jeans and a T-shirt. This is like I have a colored shirt on today because of this, and I, I feel out of place. I'm I'm dressed up. That's all part of part, part of that that outer level, that surface level, the artifacts that are around us. 
So the first level is artifacts. The, the next level is values. And so that's what do we say we value. Um, so some, you know, it could be honesty, it could be integrity, it could, it could be, you know, failing fast. You know, so some organizations value failure because you learn from it. It could be just the idea of learning. So there's a lot, there's a whole host of values that, that organizations might value. And, that, and the, the deepest level of culture is the underlying assumptions that, that kind of develop over time. So once a group of people get together and they, they start to determine what their truths are, those truths become under, you know, they, they dive down beneath the surface and you don't even think about them anymore. So, for example, my first job out of college, uh, I was in sales, and one of the, the big things that was always emphasized is we have to be honest and with our, our customers, because what, and, and it, it never really was explicit, but, you know, at the end of the day, what they believed was honesty builds long-term relationships, and long-term relationships support business, and so that became that underlying assumption that supported that value of honesty, hmm. and, but after a while, you don't even think about it. It, it's just we get you know we're honest. That's who we are. That's what we do. And there's always stories that, that you know emphasize how how those values come about and those become legends in in an organization. So that's that's what I mean by culture: artifacts, values, and underlying assumptions. Huh. Okay. So um, you re relate a story in the book uh, uh, about uh, the the San Francisco 49ers football team and the new. Uh, the coach Jim Harborough, Harbaugh. I don't know, am I pronouncing that correctly? Harbaugh, yeah. Yeah, Harbaugh, and and the transformation, a cultural transformation uh, that was made from the old way that the organization ran to the new way that the organization ran. Uh, and I, you know, I'm I'm not a huge fan of football. My right. sport is lacrosse, but I follow it some. I watch the Super Bowl and when the lights went out recently. <laughs> but uh, the uh, the part that I'm interested in this is uh, how big, because I perceive that a, a a football team of at the National Football NFL level mm -hmm. that there's a lot of moving parts. That there's you know of course you've got the players, and I guess I don't know can they carry fifty some players yeah, or well, some, some, something like that. And then you've got the trainers and the assistant coaches and all the support staff. And so, I mean, we're talking about a pretty good-sized organization and people who are very passionate usually about what they're doing. If you make it to that level of, of playing sports, then you're probably pretty passionate and I'm going to guess pretty opinionated. Right. So how, how did he – maybe you could relate the story of, uh, of this cultural shift because it's a good one. Yeah, and I think – well – the 49ers, I know I wrote a couple of articles about them, um, but they, they weren't necessarily included in the book. But, I, you know, for some of the, you know, the article, I forget if it was Fast Company or Ford, but one of those, one of those publications we wrote about the Niners. And, and I would argue that it wasn't just Jim Harbaugh, who, who's the head coach. I think it started at the level above him, which is uh, the GM there is named, a guy by the name of Trent Balky. Hmm. And so I, I haven't talked to any one of these folks, so I, I don't have any, any first-person insight. But once Trent, Trent Balky came in, he hired Jim Harbaugh. And they, they started to implement a system that just had this immense amount of discipline with not only the players that they brought on, but how they went about their business. And that was a drastic change from what they did in the past. When they were going through coaches every couple of years, mm -hmm. uh, when they were going through offensive coordinators like they were going out of style. And so there wasn't a whole lot of consistency within the organization at that time. But once Trent Balky gets hired, he, he brings in Jim Harbaugh, and together they develop a plan to uh, really transform that organization. And they had the discipline to stick with that plan, even when they were taking hits from the media, when they were taking hits from the outside, when they are taking hits from their fans, um, suggesting that this isn't the, the right way thing we should do. So they had a, a belief in what they were trying to do. They had the discipline to stick with that plan. And over the last couple of years, they've been you know, arguably one of the most successful teams in the in the. NFC, well, in the West for sure, um, but but arguably in the whole league. So uh, the, the uh, this idea of, of, of shifting culture, you, you connect that to values and understanding our core values. A question that has come in is uh, involves this, the, uh, the values piece. What is the relationship, this person writes, between um, your personal core values 
and the team's or organization's core values? Well, I think I think there has to there, there has to be some alignment. They, they don't have to match perfectly, but if if you go into an organization that doesn't value what you do, then you're going to feel like you're misplaced, and the organization is going to feel the same way. They're going to feel that you're misplaced, and I think that's why a lot of organizations and companies that take so much time in the interview process because they want to make sure that there's such a good cult there's a good cultural fit and there's a this is a place or that organization is a place where you can grow and that you're going to you know th there's a contract that you're going to work hard for them towards their mission towards their goals and that conversely they're going to support you they're going to give you a paycheck they're going to allow you room for growth and if if there's not alignment on that that values front then it's probably a good idea to to get out and get out quickly yeah, it, you know, I'm reminded uh, for a long time I ran a post-collegiate men's lacrosse club for 10 years. And I was the president and I was also a player. And I'll never forget that we had, and I live in the southeast and in and, and, and North Carolina, not in what's considered, now further east in North Carolina, Chapel Hill, uh, the Raleigh-Durham area, you've got some powerhouse lacrosse teams, but not where I live. And so there's, you know, the people who show up to play at our level, we have to travel like four hours to play one game. It's right. not like in the Northeast where, you know, you drive 15 minutes and you can play another team. But there was a, a situation that I'm reminded of about this, the cultural values that we, that I was faced with because I had be, uh, made this ruling, if you will, sort of a, uh, because I thought that I, I could, because mm -hmm. I was the president, that the way that you get uh, uh, time on the field uh, during the game, uh, which we would generally play once a week in the spring, um, and, or once every other week, but the way you get on the field is to show up at practice. Okay. Well, I was challenged one time, Joe, in a, um, by one person in particular and then another person who sort of felt pretty strongly and was backing him that the way that you get playing time is determined by your skill level. Mm -hmm. and, and these two, uh, I was adamant that for the, uh, the health of the uh, organization that that was not healthy long term. Right. Short term it was a good way to win a game, but long term it sent the wrong message. So what do you tell people who are faced with a similar uh, uh, challenge when they want to, uh, when they believe, I guess the part was is that I started to question if I was doing the right thing for, yeah. the, for the organization. Um, is winning more important? Because I love to win, frankly. Yeah. And but I, I started to question myself. So what is? How do you navigate that territory? I think so. So what you described was was definitely a values conflict where some members of a team they valued you know winning and, and playing the best players, and you, you can argue that you valued you know sh you know showing up, putting in the work, and and putting in the time. So the commitment to the team that's that's kind of what what you valued, and I would you know when when that type of conflict comes at me, and it doesn't matter if it's in business or sport. But I, I always try to go back to, you know, well, what's the purpose of our team? Mm -hmm. are, are, we, are we here just to win? Are we here to, you know, you know in, in your case, are we here to be a committed group of people that gets together on a regular basis? Are we here to build something that's sustainable long term? You know, what, what is the overall value of what we're, or what is the overall vision of what we're trying to, to create here? Mm -hmm. and I think once that's ironed out, then it almost becomes hard. You know, let, let's say it, it becomes hard to argue one way or the other because if everyone's on board with that idea of what the team's team is going to be, then then those values um, fall into place. Okay, it's, th this is the the part that I, I sort of came to realize is that I, as the leader, I knew my values and I was trying to express my values. Um, but I was I, what I realized through that experience is that I needed to be more um, um, open mm -hmm. and and forward thinking and and proactive so that um, and so what I did after this this um, I don't know the it was it was some arguments that came place and long phone conversations and people right. telling me that 
I was ruining the team and this type of thing. That's how heated it got, right? Is that I went to the website, to our team website, and realized, and I actually created a document and said, this team is for you if, and I put these bullet points, and I said, this team is not for you if, mm -hmm. and I put these bullet points so that um, I could, we could just say, he, here's how, and I, I said, we, this is up for conversation, but this is what I believe. Yeah. And, and it's uh, as opposed to just walking around assuming that people are somehow going to read my mind. Right. Yeah. And I, well, yeah. And I think that I think yeah, you bring up a really good point. Just being able to articulate what it what it is that you value, where you where you're coming from. I think that's obviously important. Um, and I think also at the same time, you know, on, on the other hand, being able to have that conversation with people about what they find important, I think, is is also critical. So you, you know. You know, having the conversation, communicate, communicating what it is you value, and, and being together in terms of what your vision for the for the larger team is. I think that's, you know, once you have those things in place and, and aligned, I think you can have a, a better conversation. You can get the right people on board that, that really align with what you value. I, I think you're right that getting the right people on board and and realizing that that what our team was about was not a fit for everyone. Right. Well, you you talk about uh, or provide in this book team turnarounds, um, which you can read about. Uh, everyone should go to Amazon and check this out. Uh, that there are six stages to a turnaround process. So um, maybe before I'd like to, if you would. Joe, to go through the, the, the six stages with us and, okay. and kind of give us a description, but maybe tell us first, how do you know when it's, when it's time for a turnaround versus, you know, we're just having a bad week, month, year, right. this type of thing? When is it time to say, okay, break out the book, we're going through the six steps? <laughs> I, I, well, you know, I, I feel like this is potentially a bad analogy, but um, <laughs> it's it's almost like you know people with substance abuse problems. They they have different bo rock bottoms, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that that goes with teams for as well. You know, s some teams like they might be okay. They might be average, five hundred, uh, or a business might be doing okay. They might be kind of right right in there with with the market leaders. Um, but they might decide that they need a turnaround because they're not where they want to be, or then they're not who they want to be. Um, and so I think for every team or every leader, I think it's a matter of, of figuring out what it is you want to be, taking a taking a real look at where you're at, and is there a gap there? And so it doesn't have to be a full scale turnaround when you realize that there is a gap. But it, it is worth looking at those steps and saying, okay, well, this is probably we, we might not be all the way at step one, but but we can definitely learn from a couple of things that happened there, and and we don't need a full 180 degree turnaround, but we definitely need to shift course. Mm -hmm. And so, from my perspective, it's it's not about you know waiting until you are at the the very very bottom. It's about taking an honest look at yourself throughout you know, it, on a regular basis and, and, and making sure that you're doing the things that you need to do to get to where you want to be. So that's, that's a very general um, way of looking at it that I, that I look at it, and, but I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> no, that's good. Well, you know, there's, there's a lot of mediocre teams out there. Right. And, and, and I think that also that there's teams that have not defined what it means to be uh, successful. And you, you talk about this in your book, about uh, uh, to some degree, so maybe we can uh, touch on some of that now with going through the six stages and uh, and the six stages, by the way, are, are listed in the book and and also at uh, the website at Joe's website. I want to take a moment and and let me put this up there, uh, Joe. Right now, uh, you are. I'm going to do a uh, share the let's see the uh, web address. There we go. Uh, that MinoConsulting.com. However, uh, and you can read about the book at MinoConsulting.com, but Joe mentioned that he's also at uh, a new position, which we're going to hear a little bit about here in a little bit, EA. Um, but maybe we, could, we should start with 
Uh, stage number one. What is stage number one of the six six stage process? Sure, and and even before that, maybe just to give a little insight as to how I how we came to the idea yeah. of these stages, would that help? That would be great. Okay, so yeah, what we did is we um, we talked to owners and general managers in the NFL, NBA, and Major League Baseball, and and then you know from the, that information, and, and we we talked about you know in order to qualify to to have a conversation. They needed to go through some sort of sustainable turnaround. So they needed to go from a team that was under 500 for a number of different years to a team that um, not only raised above 500 but actually was was competing on a on a regular basis for championships. And so we talked to that. We we spoke with all of those folks, and and from those conversations, we came up with this six stage model. And then, you know, we we wanted to see if that same model held up in business as well. So then we talked to so we talked to people um, like the executive team at, at Domino's Pizza. Uh, we talked to so that ranged all the way from a you know a Fortune 500 multi-billion-dollar organization all the way down to the owner of a small diner in New Jersey. Because again, we I think too often people look at leaders as the people that are already at the top of the mountain, right. and we wanted to make this really accessible and relatable to to all leaders. It doesn't have you don't have to be a CEO of an, a Fortune you know, Fortune 1000, Fortune 500 company, you can, um, you know, impact your own turnaround at whatever level you're at or whatever team you're leading. So we actually found through through the conversations with a lot of businesses that the, the model held up. So the way, so to your question about what, what is the first model or what is the first stage of the process, mm -hmm. it's, it, we called it leading past losing. And so the way that we organize the stages is there's there's six stages and within each stage there's a number of different steps. And so that, that first stage of leading past losing, what, what leaders typically do is they, they, you know, kind of going back to what we were just talking about, they take an honest look at where they're at. And, and they, because a lot of times what happens in organizations that are losing, there's a big theme of denial that's coursing through. And people come up with these brilliant rationalizations on why they're not doing well or why they, you know, or why they're going to be doing better in the next quarter or whatever it might be. And so instead of doing that, someone within that team needs to take a very honest look at where they're at and where they're going if they continue on that route. And, and that's essentially the first step of that, that stage is really observing and learning what, what's going on. Um, the next thing is facing reality. So that's after you figure out what's going on, that it's time to tell the group um, what actually is, is going on. And a lot of times this is a big relief for, for groups and teams because it takes a lot of energy to deny and to lie and to, you know, pretend that something's not going well. So once you have that candid conversation and, and you, you face reality, um, that's that's when you can kind of start moving on to that, that next step or that mm -hmm. next stage. How, how often, uh, I, just yesterday I was having a conversation with um, someone who's uh, an organization that has offices all over the United States and they have one office that's having some challenges and it's it's not so bad yet but they can see it coming how often is it that that you've seen in your research where it it, um, it gets to a crisis I guess um, I think that there is uh, some power in, in getting to a really low spot versus mm -hmm. trying to address something that is not yet there right. um, the, this group can see where see the writing on the wall, so to speak, and they can tell that if they take no action, things are just going to get worse and worse and worse. So this group is being proactive. I think that what you're the stage one is it's easier when things are really bad, but how do you handle it when things aren't super bad yet? Um, is it the leader's job to say, hey? You know the writing is on the wall. If we keep this up, this is where we're going. Yeah, I, I think I think so. I think I think it's about so. It's not only about facing reality. It's finding a, a, a impactful way of saying it. And I just heard a story the other day that reminded me of this stage. So, and this had to do with where I'm at now with electronic arts. But apparently, back a few years ago, the the CEO had an executive meeting, and he used the analogy. He showed a a burning oil platform, and okay. he said. 
we said, guys, we're on a, a burning oil platform. We're because the the video game industry is changing, and it's changing fast. A lot of things are moving into the cloud. A lot of things. It's not just a console world anymore, where you play on your PS3 or Xbox. And P, we're not like, and we're continuing down this road of being this, uh, you know, product business where we ship out discs to all the the brick and mortar game game places and. He said, we're on a burning platform, and he's like, and we can try to find a safe spot on the platform and try to survive as long as we can, or we can take a big risk and jump off. And, and so, but that was his way of, of describing to that group of what was going on. So things weren't bad at that point, but he was looking forward and saying, you know what, things are going to be bad if we stay on this path. And, right. But I think it, it's, it's you know to, to reiterate, it's just about how do how do you find a really impactful way of telling the story about what you are right now, hmm. and how do you make it real for people? Yeah, yeah, I like that. So, so what is uh, stage number two? Right, stage stage two is committing to growth. So once you've come to terms with what you are as a team, um, committing to growth is really the stage where you you decide you want to be something better and you get the entire group and the entire team engaged in that process. And so, you know, the the first piece of that is launching the vision. So what what is it that we want to be? Um, and then the, I think the, the second piece is really adopt the guiding values. So now we've, we've figured out what we are, we figured out what we want to be. The guiding values really provide a you know a pathway of how you're going to get there. So they they kind of provide that road. So we're we want to be this, but we want to do it by you know being honest, by doing it with integrity. We want to you know be aggressive. Whatever it might be, that has to be um, the values that that you stick with throughout that whole process. And then the third part of that is once you have the the vision and the the, the values, you have to really establish what your goals are, and and really settle on a plan. And so those those three steps are really committing to growth. This this process that you talk about as uh, and just in stage two, mm -hmm. it seems like that this requires someone with a lot of uh, one, well one some skill and knowledge and two some emotional intelligence to be able to lead the team through this process. Is it? Um, I guess the the question I have from a the training perspective mm -hmm. is it do you feel it's the leader's job to do it or is it the leader's job to find somebody to hire to bring in in other words is is that if, if I'm a leader of a team and I, I just heard you say these things that I've got to do and I don't feel like I have that skill level what would you recommend that I do so to back up a little bit, so one of the things that I do want to make sure I emphasize is everyone that we talked to was incredibly different. There wasn't um, one personality type that seemed to really impact a turnaround. Everyone, like there were some introverts, there were some extroverts, there were some people uh. that were incredibly forceful, there were some people that were really understated. So there's all different types of, of people that were able to be, that were successful in, in turning, turning their teams and their organizations around. Um, so to, to answer the question though, some, some people did have to bring in other, so some people had to fire people, some people had to bring in additional people that, that kind of filled a gap in their own skill set. Mm -hmm. um, so it really ran the gamut of, of how these folks went about doing it. But I think at the end of the day, they were informed by that first step, that first stage in the process, which is like, this is where we're at. And, and that was kind of complemented by, okay, I know my skill set, and this is what I need to do in order to to really make this vision a reality. Hmm. And, and stage three it, uh, is uh, ch uh, changing behaviors, it looks like. Yeah. And I think arguably this is, I mean, we've all tried to change behaviors, right? You know, we, we <laughs> had uh, that goal at the beginning of every year that, you know, we're going to start exercising. <laughs> Right. Yeah, we, we all do it though. I'm gonna I'm gonna drink less diet coke. I'm gonna whatever it might be. Um, and so we we know at a core level that behavior change can be hard. And so I would I would suggest that this might be one of the toughest toughest stages in the process mm -hmm. is this idea that okay, so we, we know what we want to be, and now we need to adopt new behavior to get there because what we've been doing in the past isn't working. So so our behaviors need to change to some extent. And so I think really articulating what those new behaviors are 
and then really setting the example, modeling that behavior change, and then holding people accountable to what those those new behaviors are. I think that's that's the the key to, to stage three. So, would uh, uh, can you give us a sports example of a new behavior that you saw? Um, uh, that wasn't being done and now is being done that uh, in the process. Well, yeah. The, the, well, in the book, we didn't actually use a sport example. We used um, we used an example from a daycare. Oh, and yeah, perfect. So Loyola Marymount University is, is in Southern California, and they realized that you know through a number of events, one of which was one of the kids um, there contracted MRSA, which is the like very antibiotic resistant uh, infection. Mm -hmm. And so they realized that they weren't at all where they wanted to be from a daycare standpoint. There was a lot of challenges with the parents, there was challenges with the kids, there was challenges with the staff. It was just, it was an awful situation. And so this new leader came in, her name was Ani Shabazian, and she you know, had her master's from Harvard, a doctor from UCLA, and she had run UCLA's child care center. So she knew what needed to be done in order to to have a, a really top-notch daycare. And one of the things that she saw was that, you know, just general cleaning, you know, general sanitary things weren't being done on a regular basis. So they would change, I bet you didn't think we'd be talking about changing diapers today, but this is, this is where we're going. So, you know, they, they changed one, one kid's diaper and then without cleaning or wiping off the table, they'd lift the next kid, kid up and change their diaper too. Mm -hmm. And this was during that time of the MRSA outbreak. So uh, she, she started from the very basics. She started from, okay, this is like this is the, the solution that we're going to be using, and this is, the, this is where you get the class. And after, so she showed them how to do it. She did it herself, and then she held them accountable to doing that, that type of thing. So another thing that one of the, you know, a lot of this has come back to me as I talk, but one of the uh, employees there, you know, on his breaks, he would put his iPod, iPod earphones in and stand out in the in the common area. And she went up to him and, and said, you know what, that's not acceptable anymore. I, I understand that used to be normal, but at this point it's not normal. If you're on break and you want to listen to your, your iPod, then you have to do it in the break room, and you have to do it in a place where no one can see you. Hmm. And And so just having those difficult conversations and really being explicit about what behaviors are and aren't accepted um, goes a long way in, in, in you know, it, it also provides this level of, of uh, you know, when someone new comes in, when a new leader comes in, there's often a level of an anxiety because we don't know what we're supposed to do, right? I'm starting a new job. I don't really know what I'm supposed to be doing on a regular basis. So that anxiety goes away when people tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of times it can be it's you know you look at it as a difficult conversation, but it can be something that's really comforting from an employee's perspective. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm I'm reminded uh, of something that uh, of a CEO I heard. Um, I think he was from Seattle um, when I worked for the YMCA in the uh, early '90s. The the divorce rate uh, for YMCA professional staff in the early '90s, at least, and it happened for years, uh, was much higher than the national average mm -hmm. and uh, the reason being and I, I, when this CEO he started sharing this story because he had been married three times wow. and w what he was saying was is that the nature of our work is that you want to keep doing more and giving more and and you've you've got this other life outside and um, I was so guilty when I was listening to him. I thought, "Oh my gosh, I it, it takes me three phone calls to get home." You know, calling my wife. I'm on my way home, and then I was on my way out of the building, and something I would have to address, or at least I felt like I did, right? And and then as the CEO was talking, he said one of the the cultural pieces that he emphasized the the change in behavior um, that he was going for sustainability instead of just hire because what happened was. Uh, the average national staff person was lasting just two years right. uh, before they left. They were burnt out. And so in an effort to address that, he you know, would leave his uh, phone or his pager at the time at, at home, and he said, don't call me at home unless this place is on fire. <laughs> and, and that is it. Yeah. And so I, I heard him, and, and that made a, a, a difference for me as a leader because I was 
expecting everybody else to behave like me. Right. You know, to have this. I viewed, I defined commitment by being there physically. Right. You know, being so, so, it, and then I, I realized it was unsustainable that I was on the same track. Like all of these other people. Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting. You know, you keep you, we've all heard the phrase. You keep trying the same thing. The definition of insanity, right? You try the yeah. same thing over and over, expecting different results. So if an organization is is not performing well and they keep you know they keep with the same behaviors and they, they expect something different, it's it's going to be a, a big crash and burn. But it, about that family thing, that you know, family values is another potential organizational value. You know, I, I think EA yeah, really one of the things that sold me on this place is they really value family. They um, <laughs> most of the kid, most of the employees here have small kids. They they're able to leave when their their kids are sick or when there's doctor's appointments or they they don't have crazy hours. And that's something that was attractive to me. And that's something that that I believe in too. So kind of going back to one of your initial questions about alignment between what yes. you and what your organization values, that, that was, that, you know, you brought it up and it seemed like a, a good example. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we've gone through stage one, leading past losing. Stage two is committing to grow. Stage three is changing behavior. Stage four is embracing adversity. I thought that the group had, would have already embraced adversity. Yeah, and, and I think... To a certain extent, you're right, but I think in stage four, there's this this explicit opportunity to really create, almost manufacture challenges, and and I think in doing that, you you show, you're able to first of all celebrate some of the small successes that they've had along the way, so that it might be a, a challenge that you know that they can get past, and so they get past it, you celebrate that, and when you celebrate that, that shows that the values that you've um, decided upon as a as a group, they work. And that, so they start to become a part of the fabric of that culture. So mm -hmm. that's one great thing about that. The other thing is it starts to build resilience. And, and this, you know, when, when, once you start making it past different challenges, um, there's, there's this confidence that, that builds up because one of the biggest predictors of confidence is whether you've done it before. So mm -hmm. they start seeing themselves being able to get past these challenges, big and small, and, and they start believing that they, you know, there's bigger challenges coming up ahead, but they start believing that they can get through anything. And so that embracing adversity piece is, um, is it's a really, it, 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 you're right, it does happen throughout, but it's a critical component that we, we thought, you know, it seemed like most explicit at this point in the process. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that I think ad adversity, if we, depending on how we frame it, mm -hmm. um, will teach us one thing and and well uh, like I, I had mentioned before we started this video chat uh, this webinar that I rode with my son on a 184 mile bike rails to trails uh, from Cumberland Maryland to Washington DC right. and uh, this past summer and during that trip on the the very last day well the night before the very last day a huge storm came and knocked all these trees down and uh, we decided to keep riding because we thought, how bad could it get? Well, it, it, it turned out it got pretty bad. And I was here with my 13-year-old son, and and he was looking at me uh, saying, you know, this is this was this a good idea? You know, because virtually everybody just left the trail and said, this yeah. is impossible. But uh, there was the two of us and then there was three other guys one of whom is that um, works for the national Washington Nationals okay. and he was wearing his Washington Nationals he's uh, in charge of the facilities and stuff but it was the five of us who were crazy enough to keep uh, riding but it was the in the adversity uh, I, I suggested to my son that that he look at it as an adventure and we looked at all you know that we're gonna have an amazing story once we get through this and and to this day He's really proud of how he um, kind of shifted from being, you know, this is miserable, hot, muddy, right. uh, to we, we did something, you know, that was difficult. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's, that, it's, I don't know that he embraced, I don't know that he would say he embraced adversity, but he definitely reframed it. Right. And, and uh, you know, uh, we use Domino's Pizza in the book as the example for this. And Domino's, it was one of those organizations that it wasn't awful, you know. Like every, mm -hmm. in that 2008 downturn, everyone was having a hard time. They didn't have to do anything, but they saw it as an opportunity to really re redefine who they were. 
And so yes. they actually decided to change the recipe of their pizza. And, that, and keep in mind that their franchisees, you know, that, that's their livelihood. And this is the only pizza recipe that Domino's has had in their 50-year history. And so making this decision was a big, big deal. And they got everyone on board through a series of events that, that they held. And um, they worked up the recipe. They introduced it. And, and when they introduced it, it was a national campaign where they said, you know what? Like, we, we heard you. We heard our customers that the old pizza sucked, oh. essentially. And, and so once you do that, like the way that the executive team looked at it is that they were burning all the bridges. They couldn't retreat from the new pizza. Once you say that, you, you can't go back to the old pizza once you say it sucks, right? Oh. So they, they, framed it as, they framed it up as we burned all the bridges. There was no escape. We had to commit to this. And it was one of the biggest successes in the, in the, in the food industry um, in a long time. They had, you know, their first quarter, they had 14% uh, store over store Wow. Which is unheard. The only one that's ever had been higher is McDonald's. So Wow. It was just an amazing success story, but they, that's how they framed up this this really challenging task. Well, uh, we've got two more stages to go. Uh, stage 5 is achieving success. So why did you play, what is achieving success in your mind and why is it right after em embracing adversity? What is is there a connection between the two? Yeah, I think so. I think so, you know, in sports, it's, it's, the success is obvious, right? It's, you know, you, when you win a championship or when you win a conference championship, and those are really easy. But I think a lot of times um, there's, you know, as we're going through this process, we're continually redefining success. We're continually raising the bar. And, again, we thought this was something that all of the, the folks that we talked to did, but it seemed to fit best in the model here. So you, you define success, and, and usually there's that, that ultimate uh, you know, achievement that you, you get to. Um, and so, that, so a lot of people would see this as the end of the model. Okay, so you achieve success, right? You, you, kind of, you kept redefining success, and then you made it to this ultimate you know, idea of success, but it's not done there. Then you have, to, you have to continually, you have to redefine it again, and you have to make sure, you know, some, some coaches have said that the hardest thing to do isn't winning your first Super Bowl, it's to win your second. Mm. Because once you, if, if that's been that, that vision for so long, is winning the Super Bowl, once you do it, there's a natural letdown. So how do you, how do you redefine success or reframe what it is you're trying to do in order to get people on board? And, and this seems to uh, lead right into nurturing a culture of excellence. Right. So, so um, I got to ask the word nurturing. Mm -hmm. I love the word. Uh, is would you say that they nurture uh, at uh, the Forty ers or any of these these other sports organizations? Are they nurturing <laughs> the? I'm I'm thinking of these two hundred and fifty pound powerful athletes, and right. we're going to nurture that. I think they do it, but I don't think they would say that they do it. So, so the the way that I see this is that um, once you once you've had a, a certain level of success, there's a natural tendency to let off. There's also a tendency to um, to kind of let things go a little bit, to not be as disciplined as you were in the past. And when we say nurturing a culture of excellence, we're talking about ma like making sure that those values stay true. Make, that your organization stays true to those values and they don't slowly become warped or they slowly, you slowly lose focus. And a couple of the things that we found in, in this stage that, that organizations like the Pittsburgh Steelers, which is arguably one of the most successful football organizations ever, um, but, but there's this um, element of continual learning and, and innovation that exists within these organizations. So they don't, they don't, they're not satisfied after they win that championship. They want to talk to other people. They want to talk to people, you know, scouts on in, in the National Hockey League to figure out how they look at the players. They want to, you know, look at how baseball teams look at players. They want to make sure that they're doing everything that they can possibly do to maintain that edge. And so they're always learning. They're always innovating. And, you know, that is what allows them to really maintain that, that culture of success. Well, well it's... it's um when you just uh, for a moment ago talked about uh, Domino's risking the the um, the the menu or the the, the uh, how they're put, uh, the ingredients of their pizza when they were it seemed like they were doing okay 
uh, but they're willing to, uh, to, to go for it, in other words, to try something new, right. uh, that, that it seems risky to the rest of us, right? Yeah. Um, but but and just the same what you were talking about EA uh, Electronic Arts about is that it's probably they were doing okay but uh, they being able to say all right if we do nothing if we don't continually innovate then we're stuck on this burning platform right. and how many how many um, industries right now aren't on some kind of platform it seems I was just listening to something on NPR mm -hmm. uh, on uh, 3D printing and. The uh, how 3D printing is revolutionizing uh, things, and that uh, uh, my kids love these books called Tintin. And there was a movie that came out about Tintin. Well, um, these uh, the people who own Tintin. I don't. I, I can't remember who it was, but they they sent out a cease and desist order on this website that were that was had the instructions, the code, if you will for downloading and printing in a 3D format wow. a Tintin rocket, mm -hmm. right? Now, who's going to print a Tintin rocket? Only the people who are probably your most crazy fans, and they're saying to them, no, don't do this, stop it. And and what the art of the in the news report they were saying is that, I mean, it sort of reminds me of that, um, what you were talking about, the platform, right. is that what we saw, I think, with LPs, and the record industry, right? They're suggesting is this three D printing thing is going to upend a lot of other industries. Yeah, and and that's the thing is you like you know at the end of the day you either need to adapt uh, and change or or you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, and that, I, that's a, a pretty cynical way to look at it, but I, I feel like you know based on a lot of the research we've done, it's been it's been. You know, done, you know, look at Kodaks of the world. You know, they're they're no longer yeah. in existence because they were they failed to, you know, jump off that platform in a timely manner. So, yeah, I think uh, for this last uh, lesson here, when you were saying uh, continually nurture, that 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 is, you know, at one point, uh, Kodak was they were it. They were yeah. they were the bomb as far as imaging was concerned. And they invented. They actually invented the digital camera. Yes. And, and when they, when the guy showed everyone, it was this big, you know, huge at the time. And the, and one of the executives at Kodak said, "Well, that's that's nice, but keep it to yourself." <laughs> so, but but there, that's the idea. Is once you win and once you succeed, you almost want to protect that, right? And you yeah. want to like you you want to just prevent change from happening because that's who you are now. You're the championship. But if you adopt that mindset, then. You've you've lost, you know. Yeah. Like it's a you're you're basically a one and done at that point. Well, uh, throughout our conversation here, a couple times I've I've uh, posted your your website minoconsulting.com so that people can go there and and take a look at the book and and some of the resources you have, and then I uh, you can get this book at uh, Amazon. Yep. Amazon. Uh, Amazon and and uh, probably lots of other places around. Right. Uh, and uh, so, tell us a little bit about what's happening in your life right now with uh, Electronic Arts EA, which produces a game that my kids love. It's called Plants vs Zombies, right? <laughs> isn't isn't yeah. that an, an EA? Yeah. So they play on their iPad and and the iPod Touch, and uh, so what drew you out there? What are you doing? I think it, for for me it was you know I talked about learning a little bit and I, I wanted to make sure that I was continually learning in my career. So I've you know I've had I've been a consultant for the last four years and I've done a lot of the OD work, but I don't know you know I, and our customers have been really really happy, but I I haven't been certain as to how well I'm doing the work, and so I thought this was a really good opportunity to learn from some really um, experienced people uh, in in. So I'm, I'm basically what I'm doing here is I'm I'm in charge of a couple of programs that relate to leadership and organizational effectiveness. So essentially, I act as an internal consultant to this. You know, there's 16,000 people that work here, including contractors, and so I'll be working with some some of the leaders and consulting, and trying to develop programs that really help teams uh, perform at, at their best. And and another big part of that is helping people change behaviors as we as this larger company goes through this shift. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly the gaming industry, as you've mentioned, has has changed. It's my kids now uh, will will 
go to the iPod or if they're playing on their computer, they just download software. Yeah. And and I I bet I could find somewhere in our house a C a disc, a CD or a DVD, but yeah, it's uh, hard to track down at this point, right? Yeah, yeah. It's 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 like trying to find an LP. I I got I sold all my LPs. I yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, but what's neat is, uh, and and I love games. I love learning through games and using games to help people get from point A to point B. Is is to see the influence of games and learning on our kids, on our culture. Because, as you know, the gaming industry is it's huge. Yeah. Uh, my kids would probably, if I gave them a, my credit card, could go through and buy all kinds of games if I let them uh, on uh, for all these i devices. But uh, uh, so but it's. It, but it is interesting to think about what kind of application they have outside of just you know pure fun. Yes. You, know, because you, you can you know. Obviously, we're learning, you know, a lot of the core subjects in, in any curriculum, but you put a game around it, it, it suddenly becomes this this different beast that people really want to engage with. So, I feel like it's a. It seems like you know the gaming industry is positioned pretty well right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, a as a former lacrosse coach, I would love to see uh, EA develop a game for that I could deliver to my. Make all my players play, and to learn some skills about something, and embed certain, uh, you know, a, a big piece about culture is shared language, right? Right. right. And and uh, like if you go to a group of surgeons uh, at a, a surgeons convention, they're all using similar language. If you go to a sales convention for yeah. vacuum cleaners, they're all using similar language, and and so for a high performing team. I want all my students, or all my, I, I taught high, or coached high school, mm -hmm. is, is uh, I want them sharing, I want to share a similar language with them about yeah. what it means to be a high performing uh, team. And, and I got to say that from the gaming perspective, my kids pick up the language and the how to uh, through a game without thinking about it, without, you know, Getting a pad of paper and and taking notes, they're right. just playing. Yeah, I mean that's that's. It seems like that more and more. That's how people are learning, and we always have these devices on us. So why not use them in a in a way that benefits? Yeah, yeah. yeah. As a coach, why not? So yeah, may, maybe uh, maybe a uh, lacrosse game is coming down the pike. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling football or basketball will be sooner because of the market share. Yeah. But I'm gonna throw my my two cents in. Well. Fair uh, Joe, it's it's been a delight to talk with you, and I'm excited uh, uh, to have had a chance to talk with you. I encourage everyone else to go out and get this book, uh, Team Turnarounds. There, uh, as Joe said, it's you don't have to get to a really low place to begin using some of the lessons from this book. And the book is great. There's lots of real life stories and applications of the principles. And I got to say, uh, for for a guy with a PhD, you're easy to read. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tom. I enjoyed the conversation. <laughs> All right. Very good. Good luck out in California. I look forward to uh, watching your, your career grow. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.